and students of uh, 20? 2025. How about business school? Good evening. How are you guys? You're good? Please relax. <laughs> I can see there is, I can feel there is a lot of tension around. Please uh, relax. This is going to be um, moments of sharing. We, I, I would want to ask you some questions, so you better be ready. Um, first, let me welcome you to Kenya and uh, join all the other people who you may have interacted in the course of your stay here in Kenya. Feel at home, and uh, if any one of you chooses uh, not to go back to America, we will give you a we'll give you a Kenyan citizenship. <laughs> uh, and the reason is, uh, I am a scientist uh, by training, not at the Harvard Business School, but at Nairobi University, and I slightly feel intimidated by this Harvard story. Because here in Kenya, the best university we have, and uh, we normally bully others, is Nairobi University. So we normally tell the other people, you come from Kenyatta University, and Moy University, and all the other universities. But then there is the University of Nairobi. I don't know what to say to Harvard Business School. <laughs> but uh, uh, being a scientist, uh, Kenya, if you read between the lines of science, the earliest remains of man have been traced to Kenya. So this is the home of human origin. And therefore, when you are in Kenya, you are at home. So uh, I should have started by saying, welcome home. Um, secondly, you are in the continent of the future. I say the future because as a leader in this continent, there is every reason those of you who are in business school, there is every reason for you to think about the future. And the future is here. The future is here for three and a half reasons. This is the continent with the highest renewable energy capacity and potential. As you've heard, Kenya is 93% green on our grid. We intend to make it 100% in the next seven years. Kenya will all be green energy. And the future is green. I know there are people who still need some persuasion about where the future is. I don't expect that from anybody from Harvard Business School. I know all of you are persuaded that the future is green. And therefore, if, you, if we have 60% of the world's renewable energy assets, that's the future. Secondly, this is the continent that has the youngest population. Our median age is 20, 19 and a half actually. And 50% of the world's workforce by 2050 will be, 40% will be coming from this continent. 40% of the world's workforce will come from this continent by 2050. And by 2050, a quarter of the world's population will live in this continent. This will be the largest market then. On top of that, mineral resources, natural resources, this is the place. And therefore, as you think about the future, 
think about this continent. And as leaders in this continent, we are working at it to make sure that we consolidate the African market into a single market. You must have heard about Africa continental free trade area, 55 countries, 54 already signed in. And um, we are determined to make sure that this continent becomes that continent of the future. And if you are thinking about food security, global food security, 65% of the world's arable, uncultivated land is in Africa. That's where the food security of the future is going to be. So I just want to persuade you that as you walk in the soils of, step in the soils of this continent, just think about the future. And you made the right decision to uh, come this way. Good professor, thank you very much for making it possible for these great people to visit our continent. And just to assure you that we are weaving a new narrative, a narrative that speaks to the reality of what this continent is about. For a very long time, the narrative around this continent was about war and conflict and disease and poverty and hunger. I want to tell you this continent is about opportunity. It's about investment. This is the future. A professor here from Nigeria will tell you about a Nigerian proverb that says, until the lion learned to write, to write, all stories glorified the hunter. We're beginning to write our own story. We've begun to write our own story. Many people have written stories about us for a long time. We've learned how to write our own story. And we're going to write this right story about this continent. So to you, as you think about the future, as you think about opportunities in the future, as you think about investment, business, entrepreneurship over the future, you will do yourselves well to think about this continent. And um, we will be here to partner with you and to see how we can do this together. It's no longer going to be the north versus the south. I think that adversarial uh, engagement is no longer necessary. We've made a decision ourselves that we're going to be part of the solution. We're going to provide, you know, our own ideas, our own thoughts, and inform what ultimately becomes global solutions. So together again, we will forge um, that partnership and build the future together. I don't want to make this a lecture, but I want to listen to anybody who wants to, uh, to know something different. And uh, finally, I will also ask a few questions at the end. So thank you very much. Welcome to Kenya. Thank you for uh, welcoming us, Mr. President. I'm really interested in uh, the, the energy space and the fact that there is you know, a high percentage of clean uh, energy in Kenya. And I'm curi cur curious to know what kind of role is the country taking in navigating between the energy transition towards the 100% and also the energy access to households and to the population? Thank you very much. Um, the energy transition conversation is a conversation that informed most of the debate that we, were, we had in COP28 in Dubai. It was a very pointed conversation. And there 
there is a realization by everybody, including the reluctant ones, that the future is green. What we need to agree is how we get there. And the journey to the future already begun. There are midway interventions, whether we talk about gas, is going to be a very big component of transition energy. The rest of us, like Kenya, are way ahead in the transition to green energy. We are already moving in, in that direction. And our push is that we already have huge potential of renewable energy. And sometimes the conversation is between the fossil fuel resources we have, like the one we have in Kenya, for example. We have uh, oil in Kenya. And the decision that I have to make is, do I invest in fossil fuel or do, do I invest in green energy? And we have made a conscious decision that we're going to invest in renewable energy. And to speak directly to your point, we believe it is possible and progressively it is becoming viable to invest in renewable energy. The cost of um, solar panels is coming down exponentially. The whole investment around that space Though at the moment still looks high, but I believe that shortly it's going to be the cheapest energy source available. So our push is investment and technology to unlock the potential of renewable energy in our continent. It will not only give us renewable energy, it will supply energy to the 600 million Africans who do not have uh, energy. It will also give us the opportunity for 900 million Africans who don't have clean cooking. And it will also assist other economies to decarbonize their growth. So green growth is the future, not just for Africa, but for everybody else. So if there is going to be, if we are going to decarbonize our industrialization or our growth, we need to unlock the huge potential of renewable energy, and that is in our continent. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Um, I am wondering what you believe is the like number one most pressing challenge facing the country today, and how are you thinking about solutions to that problem? <clears throat> Climate change is the single biggest threat that faces Kenya today. We came out of a drought a year and a half ago, a devastating drought. Uh, drought. We lost two and a half million heads of livestock in Kenya. We lost nine and a half million livestock in the Horn of Africa in four countries. And then we came straight from a drought into floods. In the last two months, we've lost close to 200 Kenyans to floods. And of course, a lot of infrastructure destroyed, and many things. So climate change is the single biggest threat that I see today because it compounds the other challenges we have. Um, it takes away resources that we would use, for example, for education, for health, and for all the other um, important social services we have to 
reallocate those resources to repair, to feed people, to make sure kids go to school. For example, last year, we had to adjust our budget because we had to feed an extra four million kids in school. We had to step up from feeding one and a half million kids uh, to give them a meal in school, we had to go to five and a half million kids. So again, it makes it that much more difficult for us to uh, drive our growth. And then there is one more thing that comes with uh, climate change. The whole space around the economy becomes much more complicated to handle for those of us who have the privilege to run the affairs of countries. Because when your budgets are distorted, you quickly sink into, into debt and debt distress. That's why you have 27 countries in our continent in debt distress, because they cannot handle the crisis. And especially when they come in droves, you have the war in Europe, you have COVID uh, pandemic, then you have effects of climate change. That compounded makes it near impossible to run anything of a semblance of an organized budget. So it becomes a crisis through and through. So this climate change makes development complicated and puts countries at a position where you have to choose between development and survival. So th th these are the, this is the crisis we face. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you for hosting us here today. My question for you is how can we as Americans contribute to the future success of Kenya as we go back to our classrooms in Boston and as we become future business leaders? That's a difficult one because the ambassador is sitting here and I, I have a pending state visit to the US and I don't want to put that in jeopardy. But, but let, me, <laughs> let me say this, that uh, the US is a great partner of Kenya. Um, it is actually the single largest trading partner that we have with, with, uh, with uh, Kenya. Uh, U.S. is a single trading partner with Kenya. And uh, we appreciate that. It's a relationship we have built over many years. And the conversations that are going on between us and the U.S. at the moment is on the two very important areas. The area around the economy and what we can do together to get the economy in the right shape through trade and through investment. So we are negotiating currently um, a trade and investment um, partnership agreement between the US and Kenya. Unfortunately, it wasn't ready for sign off in this state visit, but there are many other investment opportunities that, uh, we are, uh, that are ongoing from Agoa on one end to investments in or green energy resources, data centers, and many other things. The second important aspect that uh, is important for Kenya and America to work is on the area of security. You realize that Kenya is an anchor state in this region. We have Somalia on one end with serious problems. We have issues in Ethiopia. We have a big problem in fact, I will be having a meeting tomorrow with Meg and other people to discuss South Sudan and what we need to do with them. We have a, another occasion on Friday where we are doing something about the main Sudan. We have issues in DRC Congo. So, and then we have the whole menace of terrorism and Al-Shabaab in our region. So the partnership we have with America on matter security is very significant. And if we can do more around those two things, around security, as the anchor state here, so that Kenya can 
work with the countries in our region on stability and making sure that they, we have security, and secondly, to make sure that Kenya has what it takes to hold the fort and to assist other regions by heavy, having a stable, much more progressive, and um, uh, an economy that can withstand the shocks and can also support the other countries in the region. So these are two very important areas that I think uh, between Kenya and the U.S. we need to do more. Mr. President, can I add one yes. thing to that? Um, tell the story of Africa and tell the story of Kenya. The narrative on Africa, I think, is 20 years old in the United States. People do not understand the opportunity here. When I was the CEO of Hewlett Packard, I thought about Africa about 1% of my time. If I knew what I knew now, I would be thinking, how is HP going to invest much more heavily in Africa? And the destination would be Kenya. So all of you who have now been here, and you have to see it to believe it, I want you to go back and tell your fellow students, tell your professors, tell people that you might go to work for that the future is Africa. And whatever company you go to work for, advocate for Africa and advocate for Kenya. Uh, hello, Mr. President. Thank you for your time. Uh, I know prior to this, you were leading the agriculture department. And my question is, where do you see the next five to 10 year growth of Kenya coming from? Is it still agriculture, tourism, or in particular, I want to hear about technology and investment in manufacturing and how even AI could play a role in that growth story? I think the future is in technology. And um, technology in the sense of um, the whole data center space, the whole AI space. I'll, I'll give you an example. I went to 400 kilometers from here, rural Kenya, and I went to this college. Um, we were doing a facility in that college, and I went to see how the progress. And then, of course, I went to this class, and uh, um, it was an ICT class, and there was this young man called Brian. So I meet Brian, and I ask Brian, okay, so uh, what course are you doing, and uh, how is it going? And then he told me, okay, my course is going on well, but uh, I found something very exciting. Um, every two hours, every day, I can earn some money from working online on a digital job platform because we supplied internet and they have computers. So when I went, I had to ask him, so Brian, what exactly do you do? So Brian tells me, I work for an AI company in Germany. Brian has not been to Nairobi, the capital city. He's a village boy. Brian does not have a passport. He's never traveled anywhere. But look at what the internet and technology can do. Before even as a government, we have wrapped our minds around policy on AI, because we don't yet, you know, we have some sketchy. Brian already works for an AI company. That is how much leap technology can do for us. And that is the reason why the government of Kenya, and we made this one of the five pillars of my administration's plan, is a digital superhighway to make sure that we have another 100,000 kilometers of fiber optic uh, backbone around the country. Every ward in Kenya, smallest unit, will have internet. And it's a very big space for us. We believe that is where the future jobs are, that is where future commerce is going to be transacted, and that is where this is going to happen. The next action is on that space, on the technology space. I think that's where the future is, and we will use technology to make sure that we drive efficiency we drive um, uh, 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 all the other things we need in all the other sectors. Let me put it, you know, finally. 
even for agriculture. This year, we registered six million farmers and we supplied fertilizer, crop specific, soil specific, using technology on e voucher to every farmer. We got rid of all the inefficiencies. We got rid of all the pilferage. It was efficient. It was targeted. And it gave us the best results ever. Because of that, we increased our food production by 40% in one season. That is how technology, that's why I say technology is going to play front and center going into the future. It will help us drive all the other sectors, whether it is our tax space, technology is going to be very important. Whether it's going to be in agriculture, technology is going to be very important. That's what I think the future is. Hi, thank you so much for having us. So we've heard this week from the Kenyan people and we certainly experienced ourselves that Kenya is the heart of East Africa. So I'm curious in what you think is the role of Kenya in the journey towards Pan-African integration. Kenya is the largest economy in, East, in Eastern Africa. And uh, we already, you know, the East African community is the most progressive community in the continent already. This is the region where we are already at 25, 28% intra-regional trade. All the others are far behind. We are already a customs union. We are moving towards a, a confederation. We have a working parliament, East African parliament, that is working, that is legislating. We have an East African Court of Justice. There is a lot of already interaction between this uh, region. And we are, so to speak, what the rest of the continent is looking at as a template for them to pull up and, and move on. And because of Kenya's championship of integration, at the last summit of the Africa Union, Kenya and, and, and myself, I was appointed to be the champion for the reform of the Africa Union, the AU, to make it fit for purpose and to drive the continent into where we all want it to be. So Kenya is going to provide the leadership for not just uh, this uh, ESC, uh, East African community that is, but also for the continent. And just so that, uh, to put that in perspective, we've just concluded signing an agreement with, uh, uh, and we had a conversation today with the EU uh, ambassadors. So we now have an economic partnership agreement between Kenya and the European Union. Kind of, unfair, unfair uh, agreement because Kenya is one country, the EU is 28 countries. But now we've begun the journey to bring the rest of the East African countries on board. And progressively, we were having conversation with the ambassadors here, how we're going to drive that towards a continent-wide relationship. But again, we are providing leadership in trying to, you know, build this uh, relationship that brings a bigger uh, uh, game into the equation. How do we eliminate barriers? How do we remove ha uh, hurdles to trade, to investment? And how do we make the whole economy work for the people and work for everybody? So that's the kind of leadership Kenya is going to play. And we're very proud that the rest of the continent is hemming in as we, as we make that progress. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as we all know, the Kenyan people are very entrepreneurial, and Kenya has attracted many foreign entrepreneurs, including from China and Singapore. 
uh, based on our interaction with the local startups, for example, Care360, which is in the aftercare market, we've noticed sometimes there is a lack of regulation because they're growing so fast and the regulation has not catched up. So in this case, I'm wondering, from your perspective, what are some of the ways that the government is thinking about to address certain regulatory gaps? And how does the government plan to support uh, entrepreneurs both locally and also from foreign countries? Thank you. It's true that sometimes, just in the case, like for example, in the case of Brian, I told you, sometimes events run ahead of government. And sometimes we have to play catch up in some areas. I'll give you, for example, an example of um, carbon markets. We are now working on regulations, and we've just concluded some of the, in fact, it is a subject of the last meeting I just had here, on the conclusion of the carbon market regulations. But Kenya already is country number one in Africa in trade in carbon markets. So we have our traders ahead of us because we, we are moving the, 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 the the economy, the global economy is changing. It is not business as usual. It is not the traditional way we've always known how to do things. I'll give you one more example. Ambassador here has been on my case because of a company called Samasos. And the problem we have is that our employment law is behind the digital space, you know? The digital space now makes it possible for somebody to work from any place. You don't have to put on a tie, you don't have to comb your hair, you don't have to look this. You can work from home so long as you have in access to internet. But our employment talks about permanent and pensionable, that you must show up in some place, you cannot you, you must work for somebody. He must give you an employment letter for you to be said. So we were taken to court, for example, that there are people who are working for Google and yet they didn't get employment letters from Google because they were uh, working through summer. You know, so we have to update. So we have gone, we have, we have to go back to parliament to update the law so that it catches up with the digital jobs. So we, 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 I cannot tell you that uh, we have a straight answer, but we have to keep you know, pace with uh, an evolving you know, uh, uh, economic, economic environment and, 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 and an operating environment. So we, we just have to make government agile and we have to make regulations and Parliament also has to work ahead of, ahead of time and, and make itself agile so that we can always accommodate areas that maybe uh, are not provided for in regulation, as you say, or in pieces of legislation. Hi, Mr. President. Thank you for having us. Um, we understand that you've curbed public spending and increased taxes to pay off existing debt. I'm wondering if you could speak to how you made that decision, what trade-offs you've had to consider, and how you think that decision impacts everyday Kenyans today. I think, I think you have been talking to the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> because... <laughs> They are the ones who are driving this narrative that I have increased all the taxes. <laughs> now, you know, the whole principle is that you must live within your means. This, this has been my message to the people of Kenya. For pff, pff, maybe 12 years, we've been running 8 9% fiscal deficit. You know? Which means you're spending money that you're not collecting. And you keep, you know, digging a bigger hole to fill 
the other one all the time and, and now we have a debt that is heading towards unsustainable. So when I came into office, I told everybody, tighten up your belts. I am not going to preside over a bankrupt country. I am not going to preside over a country that is in debt distress. We have to cut our spending, you know, and there is no free lunch. And uh, we have to think of uh, what we need to do to do two fundamental things. Reduce, we cannot spend what we don't have. And number two, if we look at our peers, and you know, Kenyans have uh, been uh, socialized to believe that they pay the highest taxes, but empirical data shows Kenya as of last year we were uh, our tax as a percentage of our revenues was 14% our peers in the continent is on average between 22 and 25% which means we are way below um, our taxes are way below those of our peers, you know, and, I, and I'm not comparing myself, ourselves with OECD countries. You know, countries like France are at 45%, you know, others are higher. So I, I persuaded and I made a case to the people of Kenya that we must begin to enhance our revenue. Because if we are a serious state, we must be able to enhance our taxes. So my drive is to push Kenya. Possibly this year we will be at 16% from 14%. I want in my term, God willing, to leave it at between 20 and 22%. It's going to be difficult. I have a lot of explaining to do. People will complain, but I know finally they will appreciate that the money we go to borrow from the World Bank is savings of other countries. We have to begin to live within our means. And then secondly, is to reduce largesse. You know, there are <laughs> people travel first class, you know, when it is completely unnecessary. People do, you know, things that, uh, and so when I, inst I called, by the way, I sat here with heads of ministries, departments, agencies, and I told them, look, from our data, we can do with 30% less of our um, recurrent expenditure. And you know what? Everybody has gone and cut their recurrent expenditure by 30% and nobody's complaining. What does that tell you? That there was wastage. I mean, there was a place you could cut and still be able to manage to do things. So we are straightening up things. I am very proud of what we have managed to achieve. The one thing we have done is that we have pulled the country from the brink of debt distress. Our dollar, our, our uh, exchange rate has stabilized. It had gone all the way to 167. It's come down to 130. Fuel had gone up, it's come down. Even to, today, fuel has been announced again to come down. Our exchange rates, our interest rates are coming down. We're stabilizing the economy because of the measures that I have taken. I took the decision, for example, that we cannot continue to subsidize consumption. When I came into office, we were subsidizing fuel. We were subsidizing uh, uh, very rudimentary things. And we were spending 15 billion, that is close to $150 million every month 
and we were going to sink the country. So I stopped. I mean, there was a complaint for a few weeks, and then people started to understand we need to make some hard decisions if we have to get the country moving in the right direction. I can tell you, a year ago, if there was an election, I would have been thrown out. But today, the situation has changed. And going into the future, those who are making noise at me, they will be the ones clapping. That's what it is. All the top, oh, I can see the president of Nigeria is following your scripts. All the tough decisions, the removals of subsidies early on, so the matters are repaired before the next election. Uh, Mr. President, we've taken up a lot of your time, so we'll just round up with the last questions, Mr. President. Nepal, Australia, and Latin America, very briefly indeed. Nepal, Latin America, and Australia. Sure. Um Thank you so much for taking the time, Mr. President. I was just talking to your digital advisor about the new digital taxation you've introduced, and we talked to a lot of locals about um, the increasing interest in uh, social media and that as a source of income. So I'd love to hear how you think about that in terms of your policy. Sorry, sorry, I... I oh, sorry, yeah. I didn't, I, I, did, I, I didn't get your... Sure, sure, let me repeat. Uh, I was just talking to your digital advisor about the new digital tax that's been introduced as well as a lot of local Kenyans about how there's an increasing interest in using social media as a source of income. So we'd be curious as to how you think about that in terms of your government policies. Uh, okay. Okay. The whole digital tax uh, uh, regime and, and that kind of thing. We have been working with um, Google, Twitter, Meta, that whole space. Because Kenyans are a very tech-savvy society. Social media is bigger than anything you can think about. It's very big, and, and people, you know, do business, they transact many things, they do politics, and the rest of it in the social media. So what we have tried to do is to take advantage of that tech service society and see how we can monetize it. In fact, we have taken most of uh, government um, advertising. I did give instructions that we take government, subsidi uh, government advertising to the social media to support some of the social media players. We are the taxation that is going on in that space is because of the level of activity. But we're not just doing taxation because we are providing, for example, a lot of infrastructure that support the social media users, whether it is ICT hubs, whether it is hotspots in 25,000 markets in Kenya for free, whether it is digital learning, digital training, there is a lot of government programs that support the social media space. And therefore, because many um, of our users are in that space, and for your information, we are moving all government services online. So that way, transactions, the whole, you know, uh, economic activity, uh, social activity, whatever it is, will be in that space. And we need to take advantage of the presence of people in that space and see how to monetize for those who are doing business, monetize for those who are in the creative industry or creative space, and see how all that uh, falls into place. Uh, of course, and whenever there is activity, the taxman doesn't stay at home. So the taxman is lagging all over the place to see where they can make a little bit of money uh, for our taxes. Latin America, second to last question. And then Australia closes. Hello, Mr. President. Thank you for having us here. 
Um, my question is an intersection between technology and education. So I see that Kenya has a very bright future ahead, especially in technology. But to get there, we really need a lot of people. So my question is, what's the government doing to build this workforce and the talent of the future? And how do you retain them here in Kenya for it to reach its full potential? Thank you. We spend $5 billion every year on our education. It's the single largest budget of my administration. We spend 30% of our budget on education. So it's, it's a very important sector. And why do we spend that amount of money? Number one, we have a young population. And if you have a young population, the most important aspect is to make sure that they are in school, they get a correct training, they get a correct knowledge. Number two, Kenya prides itself with having the best human capital. And that best human capital is sharpened through education, training, and knowledge. So we, we, we spend a lot of resources in that direction. It is the reason why this, uh, this time last year, we launched the Kenya Open University to expand space in our learning infrastructure. So technology is playing a very significant role in, in our education sector. We are spending resources on digital learning, digital training, and as I told you earlier, we've even changed the law on um, what we call constituency development fund so that we can deploy internet ICT hubs to the lowest locality in Kenya because we realize that education is good, but digital learning is going to have an age. So, so that is the trajectory we, we are looking at. I know you have said something about retaining our human capital. That, that's very important to us. But you know, we have a youth bulge. And sometimes we have more human capital that we are ready to share. So as part of a strategy, we are signing 19 bilateral labor agreements. I think the last one that uh, we were working on is with Germany because they need our human capital. They are saying, can we share your human capital? And because um, we live in a global village, you know, we, we, we don't mind sharing our human capital with others. So, so long as um, it is properly structured, because I think um, as opposed to migration that is sometimes giving us a challenge in other areas, structured migration is a win-win for those countries that require human capital, labor, and those countries that have labor in excess. So, so that is the arrangement that we have. We have on one end investing in, our, in learning because it's important for us to sharpen our human capital for our own uh, progress. But we also realize that there is an opportunity for us to share our human capital with others. That's why we ended up with Barack Obama, wherever he was. <laughs> and you may want to know that he came from Kenya, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> Can Australia please close? Uh, Mr. President, thank you for having us. Um, I guess coming from Australia, I can sort of empathize with the struggles of being caught between Western and Eastern influence. Uh, my question for you is how do you think about the growing influence that national actors like China have? Um, what are the benefits, what are the risks, and how are you thinking about mitigating them? 
That's another difficult one. It's a delicate balance that, um, that we have to walk a tightrope because every country pursues its interests. And when you pursue your interests, sometimes interests converge, either because of technology or because of social issues or because of history. And so, just like you had, um, Max, say, three years ago, her biggest space was in China. I don't know if she was still running eBay, whether that would be still be the case or she would be thinking differently. So it's the case. You know, we live in a very dynamic world, and progressively you have to look at what are the national interests. Where is, uh, where is technology going? How are your national interests ali aligned? There are values we believe in, for example, as, um, as a country. We are a proudly democratic country. We believe in the rule of law. We believe in government that has checks and balances. These are values that we share with many countries and we pursue. We also have economic interests. We have social interests. We have cultural ties. So it is informed by many aspects and, and that's what eventually uh, determines uh, where we want to go. As, uh, as, as someone would say, we want to be friends to all and an enemy to none. It's a very difficult thing to do, especially in a polarized world where we are today. But uh, consistently we try to keep um, uh, the friends that share common interests and common values with. And um, uh, I must say, a country like China, we have a, 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 a robust relationship there are things we've worked together. Uh, we, we have shared, for example, infrastructure issues with many other countries. As I told you, America is our number one trading partner. So sometimes you, when there is a quarrel between America and China, we don't know where to stand. But somehow we managed to forge ahead. But uh, I think we are aligned. We know what the future is supposed to look like and going into the future. I think we, uh, we, we align ourselves with the people whom we share values with. Uh, Mr. President, on behalf of the students of Harvard Business School, we would like to thank you for this session. Your answers to the questions have, been, have never been political, I must say. You were very direct, you explained at great length, and I would like all of my students to follow your example as they answer the questions that I set for them in their second year classes. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, um, thank you very, very much indeed. And may I officially invite you to come to Harvard University within the next one year and so that we can meet again when they hopefully will be second year students having passed their exams. Mr. President, thank you very much. Thank you.